it's been a challenging uh, couple of years uh, for internal and external reasons. In Europe, we've had the challenge of uh, the Ukraine situation. We've had the challenge of uh, increased energy prices, uh, etc. And of course, our internal issues uh, regarding our operations in Netherlands, where we had a blast furnace relining, and in UK, where traditionally we've had some challenges. Uh, overall, globally, exports from China is a concern. And I think uh, with 10 million tons a month of exports, that's uh, pretty much dampening the sentiment uh, across the world. As far as our own performance is concerned, uh, what we had said is the European performance uh, should keep improving. Uh, so you see last quarter was better than the quarter before that. You will continue to see that trend in Netherlands, where the blast furnace, which is down, has come back in operations. In the UK, we will see a couple of challenging uh, quarters, which is Q1 and Q2. But in, by the end of Q1, which is in June, we hope to close one of the two blast furnaces. And in September, we close. We will close the second of the two blast furnaces. So we expect the second half of the year to see a turnaround in the UK operation. The Netherlands operation will start seeing positive EBITDA from this quarter. And the India business, uh, we are seeing steel prices have been going up a bit in the last few weeks. And we're waiting to see what happens uh, post the election and how is the sentiment uh, post election. But fundamentally, demand in India is very strong. Uh, and we also expect that if uh, China follows through on the actions it's taking and the, to uh, help prop up the property markets, hopefully Chinese exports will drop and that will again help the overall sentiment. Well, you're right. Uh, of course, currently China seems to be a, such an important and critical moving part, uh, especially with the fact that the stimulus is not helping that part of the economy just yet. Uh, let's focus on India for a bit and then we move on to, of course, the UK, Netherlands and everything else that's happening at a company level. Uh, you did indicate even last quarter that demand locally is looking good and we've seen that in the numbers very obviously. Yeah. In terms of expectation, uh, I know this is more of a strategy question, but what sort of annualized compounded growth can we expect from India over the next two to three years. So lay out the roadmap for us. So I do expect that the uh, Indian growth will uh, be more than the GDP growth rate. I'm talking of the steel consumption growth, okay? Because traditionally in India, the steel consumption has lagged the GDP growth rate because we've traditionally had consumption-led growth. But uh, given the focus on infrastructure over the last few years, and hopefully uh, the infrastructure spends will continue, we expect that the steel consumption will grow at a higher rate than GDP growth. So if the GDP grows at 6 to 7%, we expect the steel consumption to grow in the 8 to 10% range. So even if you look at last year, it has grown at 13%. Uh, I think last quarter was 10%. So hopefully 8 to 10% is going to be the norm for steel consumption growth, uh, and which is consistent with what we've seen in other developing economies at this stage of their development. Uh, so that's what we're positive about, and hence a lot of our growth focus, CapEx focus is on India. Uh, so, the couple of intra companies that we've talked to this earnings season, they've indicated that business activity is usually slow post an event such as the one that's lined up in the few days, that uh, which is general election outcome. Do you feel the same? Do you feel like the next two quarters could be slow in terms of demand for Tata Steel locally? And of course, the catch up then would happen in the third and fourth quarter. So, typically, July to September quarter is a bit slow for the construction sector because uh, of the monsoons and construction activity uh, gets interrupted by the monsoons. But otherwise, uh, you know, I don't see the steel consumption to uh, dip very significantly because there are enough projects in the pipeline, uh, not just government spending, but even if you look at uh, companies investing in supply chains, building warehouses, if you look at commercial space uh, being leased out for the GCCs, if you look at the railways uh, expenditure, uh, you know, so there are a number of sectors which are uh, looking quite strong. In fact, uh, the Indian market is buoyed by domestic demand and Indian steel producers have not had to rely on export markets to really sell the volumes that they're producing and which is a good thing, a good situation to be in. I think the local demand is offsetting all the slowdown that companies like yourself have witnessed uh, in the West. Uh, uh, so clearly Absolutely. time for change. But uh, before we go into pricing and margins, uh, I know competition for you has a significant presence, say, in the Middle East, say, in a country like Oman. I know there is a slowdown in the UK, which is going through a bit of a recovery right now. But do you feel like new markets could be added significantly over the course of the next couple of years, which could potentially be a growth driver? So globally, if you look at it, there's no other market which is going to make as big an impact as India. Because if the steel consumption in India grows at 8 to 10 percent 
a year, that's like uh, adding about 10 million, uh, 15 million, 10 to 15 million tons of demand, incremental demand every year. And no other country in the world can add that kind of demand. While we do see positive activity in the Middle East, uh, and we do expect over the next couple of decades more and more steel consumption in Africa, but I think uh, India is going to lead the way as far as steel consumption is concerned globally. And I guess that remains the focus for the country, uh, for the company. Um, Mr. Narendra, margins, uh, while last quarter, last year we saw, I mean, margins year on year have been flat, but uh, of course last year prices of steel were much higher than they were in this quarter that's gone by, but you managed to do well on the margin front, so maintained margins. Uh, prices of cooking coal have contributed positively. Going into F5, 25, 26, uh, margins around 11, 12 percent expected. Is that a fair assumption for, uh, for us, or do you feel like the price environment could improve and the margins could see an uptick? So as of now, we are uh, uh, forecasting uh, Indian margins to be steady at close to current levels, uh, uh, you know, without assuming any price upside. Okay, so if there's a price upside, that will only make it better because now there is a little bit more equilibrium between coking coal prices and steel prices. And also we've... Uh, uh, using leaner coals, uh, we've done a lot of work on the blends that we use, and that's giving us uh, some advantages. Uh, in Europe, we expect the margins to improve, particularly in Netherlands. Last year was a particularly bad year in Netherlands because one of the two blast furnaces was down for relining. So that had an impact on costs and margins, and hence, uh, maybe for the first time or for the first time in a very long time, Netherlands had a negative EBITDA. This year, Netherlands will have a positive EBITDA. So that'll be a big swing in uh, Netherlands. In the UK, the second half of the year, we expect to be having positive EBITDA after we close both the blast furnaces. Uh, so so we, you will see a turnaround in Europe from what you saw last year. You will see India margins to be reasonably steady, but you will see India volumes picking up because the Kalinganagar uh, uh, project is getting completed. The blast furnace should start producing in the second half of the year, and uh, we will have at least... A million and a half, uh, 1.4 million tons additional volume because we have another relining in Jamshedpur which will take out some of the volume, but net net we'll have at least 1.4 million tons additional volume in India. So that's pretty much the story for. So then, Mr. Jobs. Narendra, it's uh, very obvious and there could definitely be an upside move on margins because if Netherlands is turning around, UK is, and India will see better volumes. I mean, it's a fair expectation for investors to expect margins to move upward, right? Yeah, on a consolidated basis, yes. It will. Right. So that's, of course, the margin pitch. Another one that I want to understand from you, and I think uh, it's, it's, you know this better than I do, so I guess the sense of it will come from you. I know the agreement in the UK was reached with a lot of ease and everything is going as part of plan. Netherlands, uh, I believe there was a little bit of uh, back and forth on that. You were looking for support from the government, the blast for a six realigning. Is that all on track? When can we expect... Uh, Clarity on that front in that sense, and you know, uh, successful winding up or transfer or change of business across those markets in terms of so timelines. In, sure. So, in UK, the discussions with the government concluded in September. The discussions with the unions uh, started after we uh, had those uh, discussions with the government on the way forward. And the discussions with the unions are reaching its final stages, but the timelines. Uh, we've already announced that uh, in June and September, we will close both the blast furnaces. So that's a, a roadmap for the UK. In Netherlands, the discussions with the government for the transition plan uh, has just started officially, you know, because Netherlands also had a uh, election which had happened. So there was a, there's a change of government happening, but the conversations are going on. So we are still at an early stage, but what we hear from the government is they want to conclude the discussions during this year. So once we conclude the discussions, then, uh, uh, you know, we are back where we are where we were in the UK maybe a year back, you know, so that's that's where we are. So Netherlands is maybe a year behind UK in the transition plan. There was no support sought from the government for the blast furnace six because that was more an internal operating matter. Right. I'll talk about your fundraising plans, actually. And if you can give me a sense of uh, where will the additional debt funds uh, be deployed and how I'm assuming this would be uh, focused on India, because if this is a core market that's growing so significantly, are those investments going to be put into India to build capacity? So fundraising is more for refinancing uh, rather than anything else, because okay. I think we are, liquidity is quite strong. Uh, it's more about saying that uh, how do we refinance some of the debts we have so that we reduce the cost of capital. 
So, uh, but largely our capital deployment, 75% uh, of what we'll deploy this year will be in India, mainly for the Kalinganagar project and the associated projects. So how much debt have you retired in FI25 and in FI24 uh, and in FI25-26? Uh, what is the quantum in terms of percentage that you'd like to see in terms of debt reduction? No, we have uh, uh, some scheduled repayments. I won't get into the specifics of uh, uh, how much it is, but we have scheduled repayments which we want to refinance. And uh, that's what we will be working on. The overall debt, net, net debt figures uh, will remain flat at uh, today's level, around this level, uh, which is around 77,000 crores. Uh, but we will bring the net debt to EBITDA to below 2.5. Currently, it's at about 3.2, 3.3. And our stated objective is to bring it to below 2.5. And by the end of, end of this year, it will be below 2.5. Oh, that's fantastic. So reduction in net debt, but the net debt levels remain uh, same or uh, yeah. remain at 77,000 crores. In terms of expansion, if you're betting on such big markets and 8 to 10 percent growth like you put out for us and, and a significant increase, increase in volumes because of hopefully China doing better uh, in a few months than it is right now. Uh, are you looking at expanding capacity at this stage? So the immediate focus is on the Kalinganagar uh, expansion, which is going to add 5 million tons uh, to our capacity between this year and next year. So that's going to be the big focus. Uh, after that, we will, uh, or rather the work is already going on on planning uh, expansion in Nilachal, which is uh, already running at its rated capacity today of 1 million tons, and we want to take it over 5 million tons. Uh, we have some other projects, uh, smaller projects. We're adding a rolling mill uh, in Jamshedpur to support the uh, plant that we acquired from Usha Martin. We are building an electric car furnace in Ludhiana. So these are the projects which are uh, either going on or at an advanced stage. Uh, uh, and the further expansion of Kalinganagar from 8 million to 13 million, we will uh, uh, work on from next year because we want to complete the current expansion of 3 to 8 million. So we have enough headroom available in our existing sites to build the capacities. We've already said that we want to get to a capacity level of 40 million tons. We will pace it. Uh, based on the market conditions, our balance sheet, uh, and all other aspects. So we have that advantage of leveraging existing sites to go to 40, 45 million tons. And what is current capacity utilization standard, Mr. Narendra? In India, it's 100% pretty much across all sites. And globally? Globally, it's uh, different. Uh, in UK, it's, uh, you know, because we are closing assets, so uh, capacity utilization may not be a uh, good measure to track. In Netherlands, because one of the two blasters furnaces were down, we were at 60%, but we will go to over 90%, 80%, 90% one now that both the blast furnaces right. are back. Also, you mentioned that India is at full capacity utilization. That does mean that the 5 million tons of additional capacity that's coming on in Kalina Nagar will be fully utilized from the word get-go, right? Absolutely. We don't see a problem there at all. Right. Also, uh, you know, you talked about coking coal and how uh, you've sort of, uh, that's that uh, raw material is uh, because of the efficient use and everything that you're working on has helped that keep, uh, stay under check. Going into the next couple of years, do you think this could turn around for you or there is no worries in terms of raw material cost at least? No, I think we will obviously be dependent by international prices of coking coal. But what we like to see is even if the coking coal price is at <laughs> X, how can our consumption be at a lower than that market price because of judicious use of uh, different blends? So that's a work which goes on continuously. But otherwise, we are obviously dependent on the international price of coking coal. But I do expect that to be uh, more reflective of steel prices going forward than it was in the last year. Right. So uh, two very quick questions. Uh, what keeps you awake at night? From everything you said, it seems like you're setting yourself up for a very, very solid year ahead. And I really hope uh, for investors and for the company, that's how it plays out. But what keeps you awake at night? What worries you at this stage? Uh -huh. No, I think, I mean, hopefully I get a good night's sleep. Uh, uh, I think <laughs> so nothing's keeping you awake, which is good. That, yeah, I wouldn't say that. Uh, but all I'm saying is uh, we are in a business which is geopolitically always vulnerable to uh, anything which happens anywhere. So you have to always be alert. You have to try and uh, anticipate what could go wrong and uh, have a mitigation plan for it so that or at best react very quickly to it. So I think we have to always be alert. We have to be on our toes. We have to be agile. We have to be responsive and we have to continuously improve ourselves. So I think that's a focus not just for me, but the entire team.